Live from New York City, it's the Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll, and I'd like to welcome you to this program. This is the Empowerment Hour. I can promise you, by the end of this hour, you will have insights and knowledge that can allow you to make better choices to live a longer and a healthier life. Today, the latest on health and healing and why you should be looking at those purple potatoes that no one ever seems to eat, but they're good for you, and I'll tell you why. A special insight on how resveratrol can help us from Brian Vogelman from Life Extension. My guest in the about the 20-minute mark in our program today will be Tiernan Sittelfeld. She is with the she is with an organization the League of Conservation Voters that keeps a scorecard every year to tell us how's Congress doing, looking out for our environment. Well, the scorecard is in, and, and, well, they failed. The worst environmental Congress in history. She'll bring you up to date on that. Also, time permitting today, I intend to do a lot more on the environment. I'm going to share with you the latest on Alec, and I'm going to ask today for all of you to boycott all of Alex's funders, who are the people who pay their bills. Remember, Alec is an organization that gets together with the state legislators and then convinces them to vote certain laws into or modify existing laws to their benefit. But you're never told this. You're never told that in New Jersey they want all public health officials to take a flu vaccine because the manufacturer wants to sell the flu vaccine. That's the reality. So we're told it's for our best interest. It isn't. And the science behind the flu vaccine shows there is no science behind the flu vaccine. It's a complete fraud. You don't have to take my word for it. Read the article I wrote. When I do the scholarship and I cite it and there's scientific references, that means that out of 654 articles I've written, I've never had to change a sentence. We take our time. We vet it for objectivity and accuracy. Let them show you the articles that prove that if you get a flu vaccine, you will not get the flu and you will not get sick. They can't do that and yet they want to make it mandatory by law. So then we're going to say, why? These legislators are not scientists. They could care less about anything. They're just so corrupt. Not just in New Jersey or in New York, everywhere. And I think we're aware of that. But who's behind him? I'll expose who's behind him. Plus, I'm going to expose today that 19 public corporations funding climate uh, denialism, the think tanks, and... So when you see one of these talking heads on television saying, now, you know the evidence is really not conclusive that, um, that anything we're doing or anything in the factories are doing is causing global warming. And then you get a presidential candidates who are saying the same thing. Well, they're all either grossly misinformed or they're just down, not lying. But there's a reason why they are saying that, because they're corporations that are major polluters. And, but they're giving money. Well, I have the exact amount of money they've given this year, and they're giving it to Democrats and Republicans alike. So where does that leave us, the American public? The 12 tipping points, something you haven't heard before, you will today in depth, plus the corporations of Alex, so you can begin to say, no, I'm not going to buy that product. As you can see, we have a lot to share, plus I'm going to do a commentary called The Acts of Love, from Chris Hedges, from Truth Dig. And I'm doing this based upon my commentary yesterday, which ran about 15 minutes over my program into the next one, that looked at the big picture. And one of the things we must realize that any solution to our problems, poverty, hunger, um, militarization, taking away our rights, if we can't use the concept of love, 
the love of liberty, the love of peace, the love of our rights, and for each other, then we're not going to win any of this. So Chris Hedges in a little bit on that. We have a pack show. Let's begin. Not long ago, I was down at the farmer's market filming David Boulet, America's greatest chef. And he was showing me on a little uh, farmer's market stand there, little purple potatoes and little uh, yellow potatoes. And he uses them in his cooking and because they're sweet and when you blend them in a blender and you can use rice milk for this, they make wonderful mashed potatoes. And he said, you know, I brought these into the United States. It took three years to get the first crop going. It cost tens of thousands of dollars. It was an upstate farmer. So I met the farmer who was the first to grow these, and I didn't know David Boulay had done this. And he didn't do it because he could patent it. He couldn't. He did it because he just believed that Americans were limited in the types of food selection we were getting. And so he started bringing in other crops from other countries on his own dime and getting local farmers to plant them. Well, now there's a dozen variety of these, and they're really healthy. Well, here's the latest on those purple potatoes. This comes from a nice scientific article that says, quote, the uh, Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry, two small helpings of purple potatoes a day decreases blood pressure without causing weight gain. Well, that's terrific news because think of the people that won't eat potatoes because they're under this notion that, oh, they're fattening. They are not fattening. The potato is one of nature's most perfect foods. It has calcium, magnesium, complete protein of high quality, phytonutrients, alpha lipoic acid, potassium, vitamin C. Do you know that some potatoes have as much vitamin C as an orange? People are not aware of this. So eat your purple potatoes and don't worry about gaining weight. If you put butter or cream cheese, yeah, but not if you put olive oil or flaxseed oil on it. The year was 1992. This was at the Institute of, uh, the, excuse me, this was at the Tri-State Healing Center. And a doctor was there to show me the results that he had obtained using a pulsed magnetic healing technique. It was about the size of a suitcase, metal suitcase, but it was all loaded with batteries and it was computerized. And we asked for volunteers, and there were a group of people getting treatments of different conditions. And we, he said, let's start with depression. So there were a group of people who volunteered, and it was free, and it was non-medical, and it was non-invasive. And he put these little uh, electrodes across their forehead. And then he would ask them about their background and what kind of pain they had, how often, um, if they had headaches, if their depression was intermittent or all the time, how deep was their depression. And while they're talking, he's punching stuff in onto his computer. And then they felt nothing. They would just lie there for a half hour. And this went on for about three months. At the end of three months, there was remarkable improvement in their condition. In fact, in several of the people, they no longer said they had any feelings of depression. I don't know what happened to him. He came because of all the unique and cutting-edge work we were doing more than any other place in America. I mean, doctors, scientists, everyone was dropping in there all the time. In fact, some officials... In fact, some top officials from New York City's Department of Health to see the success we were having with people with AIDS, persons with AIDS, and the successful uh, reversal of their conditions. And they were sending people. So it was all good. Never saw him again. This is just out today. Quote, magnetic pulses could overcome depression. I'll quote this directly from this study. And this was a presentation before the Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology, a very prestigious group of scientists. Magnetic pulses could stamp out neurological disorders such as Parkinson's, depression, schizophrenia, epilepsy, and stroke after researchers unraveled how they work to stimulate the brain. 
Jennifer Roger, Research Associate Professor at the University of Western Aust Australia School of Animal Biology, and her team tested the ther a therapy known as repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation on mice to find out how it can be applied to treating human neurological conditions. Our work demonstrated for the first time that pulse magnetic fields promote changes in brain chemicals that correct abnormal brain connections, resulting in improved behavior and brain function, end quote. Good for you, except you are not the first person. You're way behind a lot of other people who've done this. And when I first asked the man when he brought in his... Um, equipment to work, I said, where have you experimented? He said, we've been using this in Texas on horses in the area, and that's how I found out about you, because you have a ranch down there in Tioga, which is five miles from Pilot Point, and this is the thoroughbred uh, ranch capital of the world. I think they're like, at that time, there were 5,000 of these ranches, and uh, he said, we don't put down horses anymore when they break a leg. We use this, and it re-stimulates regrowing of new uh, fibroblasts and other bone cells. And he said, do you remember the, uh, the movie, The Black Stein? I said, yeah. He said, well, there are actually three of those horses because one of the horse shattered its leg in 16 place, and they were going to put it down. But instead, we, a French scientist use pulse magnetic therapy, and it was able to save the horse. He said, now it's very common. And so we had this long chat, and it was interesting because I said, well, before you do anything, experiment on me. I've just finished running six marathons in eight weeks, including a 50K, which is the longest competition, official competition at that time. And I said, so my legs are just rubber. And he did it for a day, and my legs felt totally rejuvenated. And then some other runners were doing it, and we felt phenomenal. So we worked with him for about a, a month before we uh, suggested that the people who wanted to could volunteer for depression. So here he was all those years ago, 1993, that's 19 years ago, doing pulse magnetic healing. So, but now, it's official. Isn't it amazing? Once something becomes official, then it's suddenly, that's the beginning of time, the beginning of truth, beginning of rally. No, but it's good to know that they finally caught up. Now, for those of you who've been using resveratrol, and I hope you are, it's one of the five important anti-aging nutrients. It also is one of those nutrients that can really prevent major disease. But now, after a conference where they wanted to find out how does it really work, and this conference was recently held in Denmark, and they looked at some studies. Well, you think off the top of your head, okay, how many studies are we talking about? Five, ten, twenty? 3,700 peer review published studies on resveratrol. And then they decided, now we know, after all this research, what it does to protect our cells and organs. And so I said, all right, let's limit it to the mechanisms of action and which conditions is it really going to help. And let's start with heart disease. By the way, we're video streaming still from our small studio. Uh, we're going to hopefully change over to our large studio in the next few days as soon as everything gets hooked up. The number one disease killer in the United States, of course, is heart disease. And that includes hypertension, atherosclerosis, heart attack, and heart failure. Well, here's this resveratrol, res, R-E-S, vera, V-E-R-A, trol, T-R-O-L. Resveratrol, we know that it reduces the risk for all these conditions by targeting multiple factors that set the stage for cardiovascular disease. And recent studies confirm that a central mechanism of resveratrol's activity is to mimic the biological effects of calorie restriction. Now, what have I been mentioning time and again? The less calories you need above or take in above your metabolic and essential needs. Let's say you need 3,000 calories a day. But let's say you're taking in 4,000 calories a day because you didn't count the beer or the alcohol or the fat, and that really loads you up with extra calories. 
And those extra calories above your body needs, that's what speeds up the aging process. So restricting caloric needs to what you actually require lengthens your lifespan. I believe if you do it right, not just the right amount of calories, but the right kind of calories with the right energy from the right kind of calories, you can add 20 years on to your life. Healthy life, not sick, healthy. I remember once when I went to my Aunt Virginia, and she was such a wonderful person. This is the aunt who I've mentioned on a few occasions, um, learned a lesson from my great aunt during the Depression when they would feed the poor every day, even though they didn't have much themselves. That was my aunt's philosophy. So when she grew up and she went to work for the Parkersburg National Bank, and during the Depression, she was asked to go and foreclose on some homes, and she refused to. And she said, no, these are the people we're going to sit across from in church. How can you, she said this to the bank manager, how can you call yourself a Christian based upon the principles of Christ? Would Christ throw someone out of their house because they couldn't afford to pay it? If you insist on this, then you go to church, and in church, you tell the people why, in the name of Christ, you're going to kick them out of your house, in front of the whole congregation. Well, of course, he didn't do it, and she never had to foreclose on a house. That's an unusual little story. In any case, I was, uh, uh, this is when she was now 75, and she was the oldest live of all my aunts and uncles, and I said, if, if I put you on a health protocol, a lot of the conditions you have we can reverse and you can live a longer life. And she said, she says, I don't want to live a longer life. I'm happy with the life I've lived and I'm at peace with myself. And I remember sitting there trying to convince her that there's no reason she couldn't live another 10 years in good health, but she was not healthy for the last 10 years of her life. And because of that mindset, it's hard for people of a certain generation, her generation, to reverse things, even to make major changes. Not impossible, but difficult. And so when I left her, I was very sad because I knew I wouldn't see her again when I went back to New York. But she was not unhappy. She had accepted this. Today I'm saying, I don't want people to be like my great aunt. As a wonderful soul she was, her belief system is ultimately what killed her. She had to have her coffee and her toast and her bacon and her eggs every morning. She had to have um, a canned soup. Uh, she had fresh fruit in season. She never took vitamins except one little weak um, iron pill. But because the doctors, because the authority figures in her life did not tell her that she could radically change her health and regrow cells and get over diabetes and high blood pressure, except with medication, she wouldn't believe anyone who was not an authority figure. And that's the danger of authority figures. If you're an authority figure and you give wrong information, you've just given them the Kool-Aid. And that's what most of the authority figures in our society do today. They're institutionalizing. Hence, ideologies kill people. It's hard for people to understand that. But anyhow, heart disease doesn't come by itself. The belief system leads to it, and caloric restriction can reverse heart disease. And what resveratrol does, it helps the body combat high blood pressure, and it helps it turn off inflammation. And remember, it decreases inflammation cell infiltration in the blood vessel walls and improves these vessels' ability to respond to changes in blood pressure. And it reduces unfavorable remodeling and stiffening of the blood vessels and heart muscle, and hence you have less high blood pressure. And it also directly regulates expression of genes that control lipid metabolism. Hence, you're not going to have unnormal fatty acid accumulation. So you're going to have less fat. So that's just some of what resveratrol does. It also helps prevent cancer, and they've got the mechanisms down pat on that. There are 1,100 papers on cancer from skin cancer and others. And how does it do that? Resveratrol prevents dangerous DNA adducts. Now, what's... It's the modified stretches of DNA that, unrepaired, will trigger a cell to become cancerous, in most cases, in a step known as cancer initiation. And once initiated, cancer growth is very prolific. 
of abnormal cells. Well, resveratrol is a way of creating an anti-proliferative agent. And that's important, generally 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. And it also helps reduce the proliferation of cancer in the brain. So whether it's cancer, diabetes, slowing down the aging process, Rivertol is a superstar. I suggest that you take it. It can help reduce stroke, and also it's neuroprotective, and it helps you with diabetes. So that's our nutrient of the day and a little background on it. Now, for those of you who heard yesterday's show, the bottom line takeaway message is, I believe for those who are willing to be honest, that we must start now where we have time and a reasonable frame of mind, and we do not yet have any environmental cataclysmic events, though this Friday, a full hour on the solar storms that are coming and what they're likely to create and what we can do to protect ourselves. So anyhow, I believe that we have to start shifting off the existing grid as much as possible and looking at our life and saying, what in my life is not going to be sustainable over the next five years and plan for changing your life. And that means moving to more sustainable environments, working with more uh, conscious, holistic-minded people, and learning some new skills. But we can't leave love out of the equation. <clears throat> love is the deepest human commitment, the force that defies empirical examination, and yet is the defining and most glorious element in human life. The love between two people, between children and parents, between friends, between partners, it reminds us of why we have been created for our brief sojourns on the planet. Those who cannot love, and I have seen these deformed human beings in the wars and conflicts, are spiritually and emotionally dead. They affirm themselves through destruction, first of others and then finally of themselves. They are incapable of love, unfortunately. Held was written it was written by Dostoevsky, is the inability to love. And yet, so much is written and said about love that at once it diminishes its grandeur and trivializes its meaning. Dr. James Luther Adams, a Chris Hedges ethics professor at Harvard Divinity School, cautioned all about preaching on love, reminding them that any examination of love had to include, as Eric Fromm pointed out in Selfishness, and self-love, the unmasking of pseudo-love. And you've heard me mention this many times on the program. People will say, I love you and then do completely unloving things. Well, what was it? That you love someone or that you're unloving? God is a verb, not a noun. God is a process rather than an entity. There is some biblical justification for this. God, after all, answers Moses' request for revelation with the words, I am who I am. This phrase is probably more accurately translated, I will be what I will be. God seems to be saying to Moses that the reality of the divine is an experience. God comes to us in the profound flashes of insight that cut through the darkness and the hope that permits human beings to cope with inevitable despair and suffering in the healing solidarity of kindness, compassion, and self-sacrifice, especially when this compassion allows us to reach out to others and not only others just like us, but those defined by our communities as strangers, as outcasts. I will be what I will be. This reality, the reality of the eternal, must be grounded in that which we cannot touch, see, or define, in mystery and a kind of faith in the ultimate worth of compassion, even when the reality of the world around us seems so belittled of compassion as to become futile. Paul Tillich said, the courage is to be rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. Aristotle said that only two living entities are capable of solitude and complete separateness, God and beast. The most acute form of human suffering is loneliness. 
The isolated human individual can never be fully human. And for those cut off from others, for those alienated from the world around them, the false covenants of race, nationalism, the glorious cause, class, and gender complete, compete with great seduction against the covenant of love. These sham covenants, and we see them dangle before us daily, are based on exclusion and hatred rather than universality. These sham covenants do not call us to humility and compassion, to an acknowledgement of our own imperfections, but to a form of self-exaltation disguised as love. Those most able to defy these sham covenants are those who are grounded in love, those who find their meaning and worth in intimate relationships that cut through the loneliness and isolation of the human condition. There are few sanctuaries in war. Couples in love provide one, and it was such couples that I consistently retreated. These couples repeatedly acted to save those branded as the enemy, Muslims trapped in Serb enclaves in Bosnia, or dissidents hunted by the death squads in El Salvador. These rescuers did not act as individuals. No, this peculiar reality, when studied, when looking at Polish rescuers of Jews during World War II, did not find any particular character traits or histories that led people to risk their lives for others, often for people they did not know. But it was found that they almost always acted because their relationship explained to them the world around them. Love kept them grounded. These couples were not able to halt the destruction and violence around them. They were powerless. They could, and often did, themselves become victims, but it was with them seated in a concrete hovel in a refugee camp in Gaza or around a wood stove on a winter night in the hills outside uh, Sarajevo that I found sanctity and peace, that I was reminded of what it means to be a human. It seems it was only in such homes that I ever truly slept during war. Love when it is deep and sustained by individuals, including self-giving, often tremendous self-sacrifice, as well as desire. For the covenant of love recognizes both the fragility and sanctity of all human beings. It recognizes itself in the other, and it alone can save us, especially from ourselves. Sigmund Freud divided the forces in human nature between the eros instinct and the impulse within us that propels us to become close to others, to preserve and conserve, and the phantos, or death instinct, the impulse that works towards the annihilation of all living things, including ourselves. For Freud, these forces were in eternal conflict. All human history, argued, is a tug-of-war between these two instincts. We are tempted, indeed, in a consumer culture, encouraged to reduce life to a simple search for happiness. Happiness, however, withers if there is no meaning. The other temptation is to disavow the search for happiness in order to be faithful to that which provides meaning. To live only for meaning, indifferent to all happiness, makes us fanatic, self-righteous, and cold. It leaves us cut off from all of our humanity and the humanity of others. We must hope for grace for our lives to be sustained by moments of meaning and happiness, both equally worthy of human communion. And it is this grace, this love, which in our darkest moments allows us to endure. Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning grapple with Eros and Thanatos in the Auschwitz death camp. He recalled being on a work detail, freezing the blast of a Polish winter when he began to think about his wife, who had already been gassed by the Nazis, although he did not know it at the time. A thought transfixed me, he wrote. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set down by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers, the truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal in which we can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that the human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of us is through love and in love. Love is an action, a difference we try to make in the world. We love our enemy when we love his or her ultimate meaning, Professor Adams told us. We may have to struggle against what the enemy stands for. We may not feel a personal affinity or passion for him. 
Yet uh, we are commanded by this person's sake and for our own and for the sake of the destiny of creation to love that which should unite us. To love that which should unite us requires us to believe there is something that connects us all. To know that at some level all of us love and want to be loved. To base all of our actions on the sacred covenant of love, to know that love is an act of will, to refuse to exclude others because of personal differences or race or language or ethnicity or religion. It is easier to be indifferent. It is tempting to hate. Hate propels us to the lust for power, for control, to the Hobbesian nightmare of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Hate is what people do when they are distressed, as many Americans are now. But uncertainty and fear, ah, if you hate others, they will soon hate you or fear you. They will reject you. Your behavior assures it. And through hate, you become sucked into the sham covenants of the nation, the tribe, and you will speak in the language of violence, the language of death. Love is not selfishness. It is the giving of one's best self, giving one's highest self unto the world. It is the finding true selfhood. Selflessness is martyrdom, dying for a cause. Selfhood is living for a cause. It is choosing to create good in the world, to love another as one loves oneself, is to love the universe that unites us all. If our bodies die, it is the love that we have lived that will remain. What the religious understand is the soul, as the irreducible essence of life. It is the small inconspicuous things that we do that reveal the pity and beauty and ultimate power and mystery of human existence. Chris Hedges. I'm Gary Nall. Back in a moment with our guests. Please stay with us. Welcome, all of you. I'm Gary Nall. We're going to go to our guests in just 60 seconds, just a couple program announcements. Coming up in just a couple of weeks, you are invited to be my guest at the world premiere of my newest film. This is a film about our veterans. This is about start. This film starts in 1991 and is continues to this day. It's an unusual film for me, unlike other documentaries that you've seen this year, such as Death by Medicine or Knocking on the Devil's Door, A Deadly Nuclear Legacy. This one deals with the abandonment of those that we demanded serve us and the world. I can be against the wars that they served in, which I am, but I am not against them as souls and human beings. So this is a film where I traveled around and found them and found their plight and how they had been betrayed by their government, the Veterans Administration, but most importantly, how they were being treated by their neighbors, the American public. It's a film in two parts. It's a two-hour and 15-minute film, long, but you are invited to be my guest free. I will be premiering this on March 12th at the Theater for the New City, between 9th and 10th Street on 1st Avenue. We cannot have everyone that wants to come there, so it's whoever calls first and reserves a seat. It's free, but call. I hopefully will have two of the people in the film that I'm going to try to bring in to be there for the premiere. Call 212-254-1109. 212-254-1109. Two one two two five four one one zero nine. I was originally going to premiere it uptown, but I wanted it downtown so I could offer it for free. All right, so this way uh, everyone 
can afford to come who wants to be there. Separately, um, tomorrow I'm going to be filming the final shot for a major documentary on genetic engineering downtown. Uh, we're looking for someone who has a car or van to take the crew down. I'll be going down at 1 o'clock. We have a film shoot. So call Nancy at 646-926-5426, 646-926-5426. I will be bringing out within the next nine months a brand new feature film on genetic engineering. We have filmed all over the world. We're comparing it to sustainable organic pro produce. We're looking at the actual science behind genetic versus organic. And also we're looking at the politics, the money, of why consistently the most powerful people within the genetic engineering field get appointed, like Michael Taylor, to important positions in government. And why aren't people who are supporting organic ever put in these positions? The film takes on a lot of issues. And a lot of you in this uh, audience are in that film because you were part of the big march that we did with thousands of us going from New York uh, down to Washington, D.C. And you'll see yourselves in the film down in Washington in front of the White House. <clears throat> so anyhow, uh, that's coming at you as well, plus four other feature films that are done. And also, one other quick mention, um, those of you who want counseling, I am so over booked in my schedule of filming, writing, uh, doing investigative report, um, just help get someone out of jail doing who was and, and got a clean record now. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about it all. You'll hear about it when I bring this person on the air. Quiet cause, much like I did Alan Yurko, getting him out of prison after seven years. And finally, in a re retrial, he was found innocent of all charges. But m I have no time for anything except those who I've already scheduled who are terminally ill. Everyone else who has any uh, conditions, wants help, being counseled from how to have a healthier diet and lose weight, call Nadia, Dr. Nadia, and she will help you for free. I pay her so you don't have to. And she gives a lot of time, an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. 212 8744000 for that. Because I'm getting inundated, sometimes 1,000, 2,000 emails and letters a day. And I don't want people not to be reached out to. But you'd have to see my schedule, 20 hours a day, to appreciate I'm not going to be able to get back to those. So please contact uh, her and the other people who I've hired who also have. Uh, she's a graduate of Albert Einstein School of Medicine, top of her class, and the others have NYU and Columbia. A lot of good people to help you for free. Okay, Now let's say hello to my guest who's standing by. Uh, Tiernan uh, Sittenfeld is the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at the League of Conservation Voters, which is a nas national nonprofit organization, and they devote themselves to turning environmental values into national government priorities. She worked with the U.S. Public Health Interest Research Group, specializing in national forest, ocean, and public land issues, and she's been co-director of the Heritage Forest Campaign to protect roadless areas and national forests. And the, she is here today to give us the latest uh, scoreboard on the national environmental issues and how did Congress vote on these issues. Nice to have you with us today. It's nice to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very concerned for three reasons, and I would like for you to address these if you would, please. I'm concerned that enormous amount of money from multiple sources is going into think tanks that then end up on television uh, talking about why, A, global warming is not real, or uh, the, we should destroy the Environmental Protection Agency, or we should, at the state level, through ALEC-sponsored legislation, gut a lot of the environmental regulations. And the secondly, we're having a big push right now at the national level to open up, as President Obama has done now, our oceans, including the Gulf, to deep sea drilling, the Arctic to drilling, and to promote gas hydrofracking, and more on nuclear, 
uh, more nuclear plants without looking at the truth of what any of this means. And then lastly, saying that all the science suggesting that there's a human component to this is bad science and therefore there's no legitimate science. And that seems to be working because a lot of Americans believe that global warming exists but don't believe it's due to manufacture. So let's not penalize them or let's not limit them. Would you address these and then tie that into how the legislators in the House and the Senate voted to show us why some consider this the most anti-environment protecting Congress in history. Uh, absolutely. Very, very good questions, and I definitely agree with you. You have all kinds of reasons to be concerned about all of these important issues that you raise. Um, I think to sort of tackle all of the special interest money, especially money from the oil companies and the coal companies going into politics, going to the campaigns of some of these um, climate deniers, I mean, it's, it is truly appalling. And I think we've seen over the last couple of years that there's been this very orchestrated misinformation campaign that is largely funded by the oil industry, the coal industry, other polluting industries, and that they are really trying to call into question the sound and settled science of climate change. Um, obviously, you know, I think for quite some time before the last couple of years, there were independent scientific bodies across the world who had found that climate change is unequivocal, that it's driven largely by human activities, that it's primarily because of the burning of fossil fuels and the clearing of forests. But and what we're even we're seeing the impacts, you know, happen more quickly than even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC had projected in its comprehensive 2007 report. Whether it's Arctic sea ice melting faster or the fact that we've you know had the hottest decade, all kinds of extreme weather. Um, yet we have many senators who got elected to Congress in the 2010 elections, which was definitely a terrible um, election cycle for people who care about the environment and clean energy. So we have someone like um, Senator. Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, who says, I absolutely do not believe that the science of man made of man caused climate change is proven, not by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's more likely that it's just sunspot activity. Um, so, you know, these are these are our U.S. senators who are saying this completely ridiculous information. You know, Senator Toomey from Pennsylvania has said sem similar things, as has um, S Senator Rubio, who said he doesn't think there's a scientific evidence to justify climate change. We have Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky, who has been leading the charge in trying to block some of these incredibly important health protections, um, like the recently finalized cross-state air pollution rule to um, reduce power plant that travels across pollution that travels across states. You know, he's saying that climate change may or not, may not be true but they're making up the facts to fit their conclusions. I mean, it's it's truly appalling. And this is in the context of getting back to the scorecard, the National Environmental Scorecard that we just released, which is available on our website at www.lcv.org, and people can go there and see exactly how their representative voted, how their senators voted, um, definitely weigh in. We encourage you to weigh in with your elected officials to give them um, sort of your feelings about how they voted. But as you mentioned, in 2011, um, the Republican leadership of the U.S. House of Representatives unleashed just a truly breathtaking and unprecedented assault on the environment and on public health. And, you know, we absolutely believe that the breadth and the depth of this attack have made the current House of Representatives the most anti-environmental in our nation's history. And the scorecard that we just put out really is a sad testament to just how radical this House of Representatives was during the first session of the 112th Congress in 2011. You know, and even as we speak, Congress is actually on recess this week, but they just last week started votes on what Secretary LaHood, who was who's the Secretary of the Department of Transportation, who is a longtime Republican member of the House, he said that this is the worst transportation bill ever. And this scorecard actually includes so many votes that, we had to have it span, it's twice as, sort of spans twice as many pages as it usually does. There were actually more than 200 votes on the environment and public health just in the House in 2011. We scored a record breaking number of 35, and those actually just, you know, they represent the worst of the worst um, or some of the most significant, but there are many others that sort of in a more typical year would have been included. Could you? Uh uh, send those over so we could also have a link to your website so people could see how their individual senators, because there were many Democrats who voted anti-environmental uh, issues also. I looked at all their records. There are. There are. <clears throat> so we have some Democrats like Colin Peterson from Minnesota um, or um, Congress who had a just a 20 percent, which is really appalling for a Democrat. 
um, or for anyone, but especially for a Democratic Congressman Costa from California, who got just a 31 percent. Um, Congressman Boren from Oklahoma, 23 percent. And then, you know, we do have some Republicans who have bucked their leadership at least some of the time and voted pro-environment. So um, in New Jersey, a couple Republicans like uh, Representative Chris Smith and Representative Frank Viondo, who um, got a 60 and a 54 percent respectively, which certainly we would like them to see be even higher. And in past years, um, there have been Republicans who have had much higher scores. But this has been a particularly challenging time for the environment. Um, you know, we had last year we had 30, on the bright side, 31 senators and 24 representatives who got a perfect score of 100%. So certainly that is impressive. But then on the other extreme, there were 13 senators and four House members who got a really appalling 0%. And those are actually lower numbers than in recent years. So clearly these are the members who worked really hard to vote against the environment at literally every opportunity. But I think probably sort of the best indicator of the drastic change that we've seen from the relatively pro-environment Congress that we had um, in the 111th Congress, so in 2009 and 2010, is that um, there was a dramatic drop in lifetime scores from House members who lost in the 2010 election cycle to the House members who defeated them. So more specifically, the average lifetime score of members who were defeated in 2010, who were largely pro-environment, really working for clean energy, many of whom um, supported um, legislation to reduce global warming pollution, they had an average lifetime score of 73%. And then if you contrast the average 2011 score of the House members who replaced them, many of whom were on LCV's Dirty Dozen and who are really um, among the most environmental in all of Congress, their average lifetime score is just 15%. So you see a drop from 73% to 15%. And I think that sort of helps to give you a better sense of why this current Congress and this current House in particular is the most anti-environmental we've ever seen. Well, that's why I'm going to, in a few moments, I'm going to do an overview of the 12 tipping points, let people know uh, what's happening, including the University of Washington study showing, quote, models underestimate future temperature variability, food security at risk. And this is where a group of scientists have now shown that the projections, the uh, mathematical models of how hot it's going to get, are unreliable. And when the temperature goes up, especially in our breadbasket in Kansas and Indiana, uh, that we're not going to be able to grow these grains so easily because you start shifting the temperature by five degrees the grains frequently won't grow, and that means where we're going to get our grains, and people take all this for granted. And then you have to look at the, the, the organizations. One out there I really take issue with is the Heartland Institute, because if you look at Fox and you look at the conservative radio programs, almost always they have the Heartland Institute people on there. Well, there are 19 public corporations that are funding climate denial to the think tanks. Now, here are the reality. Uh, Altria Client Services, Amgen, Anheuser-Busch, you know, the makers of Bud, AT&T, BB&T, Comcast Corporation, Dago, Eli Lilly. Well, that shouldn't surprise anybody uh, as examples. Also, we have General Motors, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, KCI, LK, LKQ Corporation, Microsoft, right? Isn't that interesting? Bill Gates, his company, is big and give money to this foundation to go out there and, and deny climate change. PepsiCo, Pfizer, Reynolds America, Time Warner Cable, XL Group, and those are just some. Uh, then I have, I'm asking people to do a boycott of those associated with ALEC, and uh, just I'll give you some of the big ones. Um, uh, the for example, who are the people who are giving money to Alex to, so it can meet with your state legislators and create all, all the lawyers who write the actual state laws, over which uh, they've written over 600? The American Coalition of Clean Coal Electricity. Well, that's an oxymoron. Clean coal? Not possible. The American Electric Power, AT&T, Bayer, Chevron, ExxonMobil, um, uh, Luminia Foundation, Peabody, Shell, State Farm. Um, Health uh, United Healthcare, Visa, Walmart, the Walton family, which is the richest family in in America, together uh, they have over a hundred billion dollars. Um, Intergy, there's Intergy. You know what Intergy is? That's where Ron Emanuel used to work, and that's where David Axelrod worked, and and that's why they gave all the energy company. They gave the most to Obama's campaign. Intergy, that's the uh, largest provider of elect uh, of nuclear. FedEx. 
um, uh, Intuit, Johnson & Johnson, Koch Brothers, uh, Louis Dreyfus Commodities, uh, Louisiana Seafood, the National Rifle Association, Pfizer, Santa Fe, UPS, um, Amazon.com, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, CenturyLink, Chesapeake Energy, ConocoPhillips, Dow, um, Energy Transfer, Gulf States, Toyota, uh, International Paper, Louisiana Travel, uh, uh, Time Warner, WellPoint, um, American Federation of Children, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Louisiana, Cox, Craft uh, Food, um, Louisiana Chemical Association, Merck, uh, Norfolk Southern, uh, so a Capital Group and Union Pacific, and Walgreens. So I'm suggesting boycott them. All right, they're supporting Alec. Alec is networking with your teachers and giving them laws at the state level to implement that have nothing to do with the state residents' needs, and doing it secretly behind the scenes. Well, don't buy bare products. You know, cancel your Blue Cross Blue Shield and get it from another provider. Don't buy Pfizer products. If we stop by buying their product, we can make a difference. That's my thoughts. Uh, uh, Tiernan, give us your websites so people can go there and get how their legislator and the Senate or House voted and what some of the things they voted on were. Our website is www.lcv.org slash scorecard, and you can find all kinds of information, um, not just about the scorecard, but about as you know, we enter into the election year, who's on our dirty dozen. You can take action um, to urge your senators and representatives to vote pro environment as we see some of the upcoming votes. But I do want to... Um, not leave people with the impression that that everything is absolutely terrible. In fact, there was some good news coming out of 2011, which is that, you know, of course we saw the House, as I said, voted an unprecedented number of times against the environment, but uh, the U.S. Senate and the Obama administration actually stood firm against the vast majority of these attacks. So the Senate blocked many of the most damaging House-passed bills. The Obama administration also made clear its opposition to the House agenda and offered numerous strong statements that catering to polluters is not a jobs agenda and that, in fact, the president would have vetoed many of these House bills had they reached his desk. And there's also there's some, um, you know, some great progress over the last couple of years that the administration has made. Among the highlights are that the administration proposed the next round of fuel efficiency and global warming emission standards for cars, which are, of course, critical to reducing our dangerous dependence on oil. As I mentioned, they finalized both the cross-state air pollution rule and also the mercury and air toxic standards to reduce power plant pollution, which will save thousands of lives um, and really just improve the health for millions of Americans across the country. And, of course, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the fact that they delayed and then you know, subsequently rejected the harmful Keystone XL tar sands pipeline that would threaten our waterways and would result in triple the global warming pollution of conventional crude. So, of course, there were some disappointments on the administrative side including the decision to delay critically needed new smog standards. But on balance, we feel like the administration accomplished quite a lot in 2011 and that their record stands really in sharp contrast with the most anti-environmental house that we've ever seen. Well, I appreciate you sharing all this with us, Taryn. And thank you very much for being with us today. All the best. I'm Gary Knoll. Back in a moment. Please stay with us. Heavy with us, everyone. I'm Gary Nall. Um, in the extent, excuse me, in the extended version of our program, which you can hear over the internet, I will deal with the twelve tipping points. But we have Myron in studio right now. Hi, Myron. Hi, Gary. How are you? Good. I just wanted to come on and talk about uh, the fact that it's just amazing how many people are coming and seeking out our signature content on the internet. And finding out that what we offer is the most empowering blend of progressive articles, multimedia, and minds anywhere on the web. It's all because we take pride in putting ideas ahead of ideology, and it's bringing thousands of new listeners daily. This morning when I googled us on there, um, 452 million hits. 
we were in first, second, and third place on that listing. So I think people are finally realizing they're not limited in the information sources they have. That's right. That means we have the best content, the most, the most informative, the most empowering, and it's all right there, and, and the search engines, you know, speak the truth. And once we start with a new campaign, I'm also looking to hire a full-time PR person because we're going to start in another three weeks with a whole lot of new, a new website and a new drive on issues. This is going to be issues, taking one issue per month and uh, including the issues of vaccination and the issues of um, um, gas hydrofracking and, and nuclear and so if anyone knows a really good quality, a big Rolo a, a Rolodex for contacts and resource, they can contact uh, you. Give me your number. Uh, it's 646-926-5427. Thank you, Myron. And for the, we have to say goodbye to those of you who are listening to an hour of the program. The, the rest of you can continue because we're going to get to our 12 tipping points in a moment. Also, we have something for those individuals who do not have Internet access. They can now hear any of the programs I do over their telephone. Tell us about that. That's brand new today. Yeah, today we're making it even easier to hear it all uh, for people who don't have the Internet, can't have it 24-7. They're in their car. They want to listen in. Um, any time any, any, anytime of day to listen live, just call from any line, 832-280-0066. Uh, the number again, 832-280-0066, and you'll be able to listen live to our 24-7 stream. Great. So you're no longer limited if you don't have Internet access because of the technology. Now you can hear any of the shows. Thank you. Elizabeth, a driver was stuck in a traffic jam on the Beltway outside Washington, D.C. Nothing was moving. Suddenly a man knocks on the window. The driver rolls down the window and asks, what's going on? The man replies, terrorists have kidnapped Congress and they're asking for a hundred million dollar ransom. Otherwise they're going to douse them all in gasoline and set them on fire. So we're going from car to car collecting donations. How much has everyone given on average, the man says. The man replies, roughly a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> what are you agree with that? We all agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got something here that is familiar, frankly, to a lot of us, a lot in the audience, including me also. Um, this was a man who watched you, Gary, uh, with Michael Moore. You walked past him. He was sitting in a in the, uh, the hamburger restaurant just down uh, stairs, actually, um, eating French fries, cola, and a hamburger. He's been listening to you for five years, and when he saw you, he he was very embarrassed. Um, he uh, has all his life eaten garbage and uh, just he didn't even have to say anything or anything to you. He just looked at you and that was enough for him because it reminded him that he's not been li living an authentic life. And while he was eating this uh, all this sort of junk food, he decided to put it all down and he's changed very fast. Um, he says that if he trusts you completely because he says that if he um, saw you charging people 500 to a thousand dollars per visit for um, counseling or if if you'd been uh, given endorsements to put your name on people's products he may have believed the information but he wouldn't have trusted you and he says but you've never compromised you've never taken endorsements you've never charged for any healing and you've clearly had all the opportunities um, he's an ex-school teacher and he says that he's had gas and bloating and swollen ankles and a hard time sleeping at night he has mucus all the time and a pot belly and he says that if he's going to hold another to a high standard, then he realizes he has to hold himself to a high standard, to the same standard. Hmm. Okay. I, I, don't, I didn't see him. You know, th yeah. There's one right here on the corner. Yes, okay. that's right. Well, good. Well, if, that's I think wants, it's important that people do. Are, are, they, are they holding themselves to the same standards of accountability that they expect others to be held to? Mm -hmm. I think that's how we all have to live. Otherwise, we're nothing but hypocrites. Right. You know, I mean... Uh, I think we have to join together and come from a deeper, more meaningful place. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, thank you. To the 12 tipping points. Um, by the way, which program follows ours? 
whistleblowers. Okay, I don't want to run into their time because they always have great guests. So what I'm going to do is this. On tomorrow's program, I'm going to begin our program with the 12 tipping points. Take me about five minutes. But it's important you know these 12 tipping points because what you have to understand is four of the 12 are tipping and nothing we are going to do now will reverse it. But what can we do to get out of harm's way, individually, as families, as a society? Well, the society is not going to do anything, but you can. And at the end of the day, it's the person that goes to some high ground and everybody else waiting for the tsunami to come in uh, to take their close-up picture. You know, there comes a point where you just have to say, I know the truth, I'm going to act on it. Well, tomorrow you'll get the 12 tipping points in depth. Also, let me just remind you that... um, On Thursday, I'm going to be having the newest information on 9-11 from the group that has decided to only have scientists involved so they can hold at the highest standard information. So you'll know more about that. And then on Friday, the whole show is on the solar storms. We're out of time. Thank you all very much. Look forward to sharing more tomorrow. Have a nice day, everyone. You are listening to PRN.FM, the Progressive Radio Network. Join Bernie Siegel, the great mind-body wellness guru, with me, Harvey Wasserman, at the Solartopia Green Power and Wellness Show, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday on the Progressive Radio Network.com. Dr. Siegel is the great pioneer of using humor and interpersonal connections to cure disease, including cancer. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope you're coming with us. PRN is your number one stop for progressive health, fitness, and food. Featuring prescriptions for health with Len and Vicki Saputo. A few things I'm growing older now. You know you're getting old when everything either dries up or leaks. Oh dear. Being young is beautiful, but being old is comfortable. That's for sure. Well, if you don't have aches and pains. That's really neat that you you cheer us up, Vicki. We're talking about so many serious things that sometimes you can get a downer. It's all about food with Karen Hartglass. We've got all this industrial agriculture going on and I love progress and I love technology but sometimes things get a little out of hand and that's true when it comes to the factory farming of animals bad news horrific cruel environmentally damaging people are eating a lot more today and what's happening our health is in the toilet fitness express with Anthony DeMarco our goal is to share the best practice of the world's best progressive fitness minds create a forum where people can create fitness goals and get questions answered and change the way people think about fitness. And The Natural Nurse with Ellen Cammy and Dr. Z. One of the many topics that would be an excellent thing to focus on for yourself and your family right now is the use of herbal medicine. Make sure that you have knowledge at your fingertips to take care of yourself and your family with natural remedies, including herbs. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope you're coming with us. Progressive Radio Network, now on your iPod or smartphone. Go to ProgressiveRadioNetwork.com and click on your device to hear us anytime and anywhere. ProgressiveRadioNetwork.com, your home for news and information. Well, I won't back down. No, I won't back down You can stand me up at the gates of hell But I won't back down Hello and welcome to Honesty Without Fear The Whistleblower's Radio Hour I am Steve Cohn, your host for today Honesty Without Fear is not just talk radio We're here to make change We want to encourage you to both call us with questions or submit your questions online. 
To call in a question, please dial 1-888-874-4888. To submit a question online, come to our very new and much better website, whistleblowersradio.org. We just updated it. And when you come to that website, it's very simple, whistleblowersradio.org. If you just click where it says contact us and a screen will pop up in which you can type in your question and submit it. You can submit questions anonymously or with your name. Uh, Today we have, I think, an extremely important show. Uh, For the first half, I will be interviewing one of the brave and courageous FDA doctors who had the courage to blow the whistle on major safety violations at the FDA, Dr. Eva Zerska. She was an original member of what's known as the FDA-9, nine nine doctors and scientists who stood up for public health and safety, most of whom have been fired by the agency. Dr. Zerska was also one of the targets of the selected covert spying operation that FDA set up to monitor the protected disclosures of whistleblowers. She was fired after 24 years of public service. I'm honored not just to have her on the show, but I'm also representing her as an attorney to try to fight for her rights to get her job back. So we'll be, I'll be interviewing her and we'll be open for questions. During the second half of our show today, the legal director of the Whistleblower Center, Richard Renner, will be interviewing a new author, Mr. Ayal Press, about his book called Beautiful Souls, Saying No, Breaking Ranks, and Heeding the Voice of Conscience in Dark Times. This is a book about people who stood up, who faced morally compromising positions, and took a stand. Uh, It's very apropos for whistleblowing. Uh, I know Richard will be interviewing him and also talking about a book event he'll have for this evening. But let's get now with the FDA-9 and the scandals at the Food and Drug Administration and the suppression of medical science within that agency. Uh, Dr. Zerska, are you on the line? Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Steve. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have you here. And I also want to state before I start with the interview, for anyone who wants to support these FDA doctors and scientists, if you come on to the website whistleblowers.org or whistleblowerradio.org, you'll see a take action and you can click that It's very, very easy to have your voices heard to support the courageous doctors and scientists over at FDA. Uh, Dr. Zerska, uh, welcome. And if you can just tell us a little bit about your background in terms of your expertise as a doctor and scientist. Um, I graduated from medical school. I also went to PhD program and completed my thesis in human genetics. Then I came to this country from Poland um, over 30 years ago as a visiting scientist. I did extensive research uh, um, uh, back in Poland, in France, and then in, in the laboratories of Food and Drug Administration in the area of non-ionizing radiation like microarrays, extremely low frequency uh, fields. Um, and I have several publications. I uh, um, uh, had uh, held it several positions in Bioelectromagnetic Society, including uh, being a president of the society um, uh, like uh, three years ago. Um, and um, at a certain point, I uh, transferred from um, research to Office of Device Evaluation as an expert in, an, in non-ionizing radiation to 
um, uh, provide uh, expert uh, um, reviews to the devices that include uh, the radiation that that I know uh, well about. And, and and if you can just please just describe to our listeners when you say what is being a reviewer. Uh, within the FDA in the device section, and about how many reviews did you either participate in or were you a lead reviewer? Uh, the expert reviewer is uh, a person that uh, reviews documents from the point of view of, of uh, his or her expertise. Uh, I have been a, a lead reviewer on several documents countless times. It, it would be probably up to thousands since I've been uh, in Office of Device Evaluation um, about 17 years. Um, and um, uh, uh, I, I did provide um, expert reviews from um, and consults to other reviewers. Uh, I also, um, at, at least at, at uh, most of my career, uh, I uh, was in charge of the uh, new technologies that were coming uh, for the review in in, uh, uh, in the submission, like PMAs or IDEs. And then those would be the more complicated reviews of, of new devices yes. that could pose substantial risk to patients that are being uh, uh, reviewed or examined through those devices. Exactly. And as I understand it, before you were fired by the FDA, uh, after blowing the whistle, you'd worked for the U.S. government and public service for 24 years? Yes. And now, uh, in going back and looking over this case, there was a group known as the FDA-9, nine doctors and scientists who wrote a letter to the Obama transition team uh, complaining about health and safety risks at the FDA and management misconduct and pressure. Uh, I understand you were an original member of the FDA-9? Oh, yes. I was an uh, original member of um, the group that noticed uh, uh, that the review process is inappropriate. It's, it's <laughs> being uh, mishandled. We actually went first to FDA commissioner uh, who started investigation, but it didn't go anywhere. Uh, therefore, we've decided to contact uh, uh, um, John Podesta in Obama transition team, um, the Congress and Office of Special Counsel. Now, what, just very generally, I know, uh, and I'm not asking you to reveal anything that might be considered confidential, although I must state for our listeners, in reviewing this case, it's pretty outrageous that the FDA would intimidate and scare doctors and scientists from alerting the public to health and safety risks under the pretext that somehow medical information can be kept confidential from the American public. I don't understand how that can be. We're not talking about troop movements or classified information. We're talking